Welcome to the First Cup Podcast live on CBS Sports Network. I'm Rick Game, and that right there is Patrick McDonald. And we've got a lot to talk about. A new champion golfer of the year, a historic season by not one, but two different golfers. And now the long wait until the next major. Patrick, it's always a fun day to recap the final major of the year, but it's also a sad one, too. It's very sad, right? What what do we have to look forward to now? No offense to the 3M Open. I am looking forward to that. I love TPC Twin Cities. Big fan of that part of the country. FedEx Cup playoffs are a postseason. And so, yeah, we, we got, what, 200 days till the Masters? And so I'll, I'll, I'm already on to my research for Augusta National in 2025. All right. You are ahead of the game. I want to look at the historical context of Xander Shoffley's season and and career thus far, but let's just put a bow on this Sunday final round because there were a ton of guys in the mix yesterday and it was clear that someone was going to emerge. The guy that emerged was Xander. Thanks to that six under 65. And I went back and I was looking through all the shots and the the footage. I, I think he might have been nearly perfect yesterday, Patrick. He did not miss a shot. He even said afterwards it was the best round he's ever played in his career. And he hit 16 out of 18 greens in regulation, including all nine there on the back nine. The up and down on 16, I think, was an underrated shot as well. The approach into 11 to set up the only birdie of the day on the most difficult hole also was, I mean, downright filthy. And it, it seemed to me, Rick, that he looked at the scoreboard He saw the names there. He realized, hey, I'm a top three player in the world. I am the reigning PGA champion. I am the best player on this board. It's time to go out and prove it. He said that he really looked on uh, at those leaderboards throughout the day, thanking the PGA championship experience, right? He said normally before Valhalla, he would try to kind of shy away from looking at the leaderboard, right? Just stick to his game, stay in his own lane. And then he said at Valhalla, he really leaned into looking into those leaderboards. He liked how it felt. He did it again at the open, felt unusually calm was his words. And uh, we saw what he did with that four under back nine. Is there any case to be made to not look at scoreboards coming in? You, We always hear some guys like to look, some guys never look. I cannot imagine a scenario in a sporting event of any kind that you would not want to know where you stand. Could you imagine LeBron James not knowing if his team was up by two down by three? Like it's bizarre to me that there are some guys who don't look. I totally agree. We'd have more uh, J.R. Smith situations, right? From, uh, from that finals, you bring up LeBron James. Yeah. I think if you don't want to look at the leaderboard, the first, uh, first three days, that's totally fine. Right. You're, you're kind of just jostling for positioning at that point. Not a lot on the line quite yet, but come Sunday, especially with the leaderboard that was that packed, that congested, I feel like you have to be a leaderboard looker. Especially if you're trying to win. If you're just trying to play the best that you can and take whatever result you get, that's fine. But that's not what Xander is at at this point in his career because the major championship season that he just put together was nothing short of spectacular. Top eight finishes in all four majors, two wins. So that's also a, an eighth place finish at the Masters, a T7 at the U.S. Open. And Patrick, you, you've you been all over this. The, the short list of names of golfers that have accomplished a major championship season like Xander has had is uh, very, very impressive. They're all time names, players to win multiple majors in the same year, including all four top tens in the major championships. It's really the, the greatest players of all time, right? Palmer player, Nicholas Watson, Woods, Jordan Spieth, uh, if you want to call him one of the greatest players of all time, TBD, and now Xander Shoffley in the year 2024. So it's just been an unbelievably consistent year. His floor seems so high. Not only does he have four straight top 10s in major championships, uh, Rick, he has 11 straight top 20s dating back to that 2022 Masters, which was actually his last miscut worldwide uh 52 straight made cuts as well and so 15 top 10s and 30 major appearances he's finally matched that high floor that lurking ability that he's always seemed to have in major championships with a super high ceiling and we saw that on full display there on sunday 
it also starts to elevate him into a different tier of golfer. We see this all the time for regular PGA Tour starts or for wins at major championships. One is great. The first one is great. The second one is validation, and it it, it elevates you very quickly. And quickly it has been for Xander Shoffley, obviously, two wins in his last three major championships. But this puts him in the modern total of Dustin Johnson, Colin Morikawa, Justin Thomas, John Rom, Scotty Scheffler, and Bryson DeChambeau, along with Xander Shoffley, all sitting at two major championships. This was um, an era, you know, going into the year that I think we would have pinpointed Scotty or Colin Morikawa or maybe Bryson or John Rom as, as kind of running away from the rest of the pack. But Xander has quickly entered the conversation. He has, and, and some of those guys, it took a little bit of time for them to get major number two, right? Justin Thomas talked about how difficult it was for him to get that second major five years apart with that PGA Championship. Bryson DeChambeau, it took four years between his U.S. Opens as well, and, and Xander's got it within three major championships. He has both of his. So I don't know if it's a true running downhill situation for Xander Shoffley, if he's going to just pick them off one by one, because look, he's played well at the masters. He's contended there before the year that Hideki Matsuyama won the year that Tiger Woods won as well. He's played great in the U S open as well. And although Scotty Scheffler is still the best player in the world, I, I've been saying for a few months now that Xander Shoffley is the most well-rounded player in the world you look at his statistics he's a phenomenal putter he's super long off the tee now the distance gains have gotten a, a ton of headlines but he's also pretty accurate off the tee as well which uh, really helped him there sunday at the open so he's got the entirety of his game going it looks like that swing is there to last and it seems like perhaps it's only just the beginning rick i'll toss it back to you though of those players at two major championships who gets number three first I think if you would ask me this at the beginning of the year, I would have said John Rahm. I mean, I just thought that he was uh, trending in the right direction. He has not had a good year. I think the answer is still Scotty Scheffler for me. Um, high end upside, plenty of of capabilities of of, of winning uh, major championships. But you could convince me. I think the short list is Scotty, Colin Morikawa, and then kind of TBD on on Rombo, who actually had his best uh, major championship of the year last week at the at the Open Championship. But what I what I think is so interesting about this is some of these guys you worry about venues for them. You know, Bryson has not been good at Open Championships, and we've seen guys that struggle or thrive in specific places. Brooks Kepka has all of his all five of his majors at the U.S. Open and, and the Open and the uh, PGA Championship. You nailed it, I think, with Xander's well-rounded nature is he's already shown that he can play well at Augusta National. Uh, he is long enough at U.S. Opens. He's well-rounded enough at PGA Championships, and he and he embraces the link style of golf at, at Opens. Like, there, there's not a bad spot for him, and you're talking about him probably having eight to ten years at least of a lot of really good opportunities at majors. You know, his dad did say that he'd be the guy after Tiger to complete the career Grand Slam. And the recency bias is obviously high with this one, no doubt about it. But you look at some of the guys, Scotty Scheffler still needs three of them. Bryson DeChambeau still needs three of them. John Rahm, he needs an Open and a PGA Championship. And so you look at Xander and what he's already done at Augusta National, like I said, contending. Seems like he's always inside the top 20 there, finished inside the top 10, obviously, this year as well. And then the Open or the U.S. Open, I mean, he was not good at Pinehurst number two for his standards. He was horrible off the tee. The putter came came and gone, and uh, he still finished inside the top 10 there. So his floor just seems so high, and like you said, a, a great fit for whatever golf course you put him on. Yeah, it, it really is, and I think the question that immediately emerged after Xander's win yesterday was looking at his season as a whole. Scotty Scheffler has six wins, one of them being – the Masters, I still believe that that is the season that most guys would like to have. That's the season that I would like to have. But two wins, both of them being major championships for Xander Shoffley has certainly entered the conversation. Yeah, I mean, it's great for uh, talking heads like us, right? We get to talk about if Scotty Scheffler's season of six wins, a Masters, a win at Jack's place, and a player's championship is worse than Xander Shoffley, who had one of the all-time major seasons with two major trophies on his mantle. So I think it's a 1A, 1B situation. I'm on the other 
end of the spectrum of you. I'd rather have the two major championships. I think looking back at 2024, I will remember the major championships more than the PGA Tour wins and the signature event wins and all that. But it's kind of choose your own adventure, right? Choose your own flavor. It's almost apples to oranges. But we still have the postseason, Rick. We can't forget about that. That's right. One of these guys might get hot and decide the player of the year trophy just in the final uh, few weeks of the season with the tour championship and the other playoff events. Hey, it's also an Olympics year. Um, There were a couple of other names and notables that were in the mix on Sunday at the open championship. Plus we're going to circle back and do a little bit of uh, historical context on, on this major season compared to others and what our big takeaways are going to be. But first we are going to take a quick break. Welcome back to the First Cut Podcast live on CBS Sports Network. And Patrick, we have been talking a lot about Xander Shoffley and his place in history. But the the leaderboard that we got at this week's or last week's Open Championship was splendid. Remember, we entered the final round with six golfers tied for second. There were a lot of big names lurking in that group. And just behind it, I want to talk about the two guys that ended up finishing in that runner-up position, two shots back of Xander, and start with Justin Rose, who only had one blemish on the card on Sunday. That was a bogey on the par four 12th. Other than that, I thought not only on Sunday, but all week long, he had a strategy and he stuck to it. I think that Justin Rose, based on expectations coming into the week, was the guy that I was most impressed with at the Open. He was awesome. And like you said, this leaderboard really had a little something for everyone. You had veterans looking for major number two with Rosie and Adam Scott. Guys like Horschel looking for his first and then Cinderella stories intertwined uh, among all that as well. And so Rosie was awesome to watch. I felt a little bit sentimental watching him. It kind of reminded me of some of these NBA players going into the twilight of their careers, the end of their careers. And at almost 44 years of age, this felt like Rose's last real go. And if he had gotten across the finish line 26 years on from Royal Birkdale, it was like, okay, this is a guy who has the game to contend into his late forties in major championships. And so, like you said, Rick, I thought he was pretty much flawless on Sunday outside of a two hole stretch. The drop shot on 12 obviously hurt, and then the exchange on 13 playing alongside Xander Shoffley. Shoffley had a putt just outside 16 feet for birdie. Rose was inside him about half that distance. Xander makes his, Rose misses his. Those two holes produce a two-shot difference, and that's really the end uh, end result, the difference at the end. So it was awesome watching him. And, and Rick, I have a Justin Rose stat for you that I'm sure you will love, and one that I honestly found pretty surprising. He is fifth in terms of top 10 finishes in major championships since 2015. He's behind Rory, Brooks, DJ, Xander, and ahead of Jordan Spieth also. He has, during that time frame, one, two, three, four separate runner-up finishes as well. A lot of close calls there. And that's obviously all since his 2013 win at the U S open. The other thing I like about this story is, is not only did I like the way that uh, Rosie was playing all the stuff that he was saying uh, in his, in his presser, but remember he opened qualified for this Patrick. And we have seen in the last few years of golf, we have seen a lot of guys opt out of trying to qualify for the U S open or the open championship, whether they're just not interested, they're kind of wondering how competitive they are. He got in through open qualifying and almost parlayed it into a claret jug. Yes, the respect level I have for Justin Rose has always been high, but it has gotten even higher these past couple of seasons, playing a a great role there for the European Ryder Cup team there in Rome, kind of putting guys under his wing like a Robert McIntyre. And we've seen what that experience has done for Bobby Mack just over the past couple of months. And you look at the guys on Live Golf, Henrik Stenson, Lee Westwood, Ian Poulter, Graham McDowell. If 
you throw Justin Rose on that list, you go, okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it could have been a very tempting proposition for him to go over there, get the bag and not have to really qualify for anything. Right, Rick. But instead he dug it out of the dirt. He rediscovered his game. He won on the PGA tour last year. He goes through open qual- qualifying this year, almost wins the Claret jug. And it, it's really just uh emblematic of the professional that he is and has been over the, these last couple of decades. Yeah. Really, really cool to see. Found myself rooting for Rosie. Found myself rooting for Billy Horschel who closed with a Sunday 68. And this was a little less flawless. I suppose more flawed for Billy who made uh, two bogeys on the front nine and made a bogey on 10 Patrick. By the time he rattled off three straight birdies on 16, 17 and 18, it was probably too little, too late. He was probably playing for pride at that point. But needless to say, you add up every single stroke at the end of the week and see where you're at. Yeah, it was a, uh, it was really that middle portion of his round. It, it kind of coincided when Xander was going nuts on the beginning of his front nine. The bogey on the postage stamp really hurt him. It, I mean, we saw guys making birdie on that hole on Sunday. Obviously, a difficult hole. A par would have been just fine. But he had a great bunker shot from that bunker short and right of the green, just wasn't able to cash it in. And then the approach shot into 10 as well was uh, not his best effort, kind of short-sided himself to that right pin below the surface, chipped it to 20 feet, was unable to make it. And so, yeah, like you said, he obviously finishes two strokes back, but it really felt there on the back nine. He didn't really have much of a chance to win the open, but this is a, uh, a great experience for Billy Horschel. He's done a lot in his career, win a FedEx Cup, win two Zurich Classics. I believe you were the one to mention that, both as a team and individually, the Zurich Classic double, a truly rare feat. And uh, despite all that, despite a lot of good play, he's won you know playoff events too. He's been really bad in major championships, to tell you the truth. You, you talk about that 2013 U.S. Open. That was his only top 10 finish going into 2024. And he doubled that this year, PGA Championship, and then a runner-up, his best result ever in a major championship. So he's always been a fiery competitor, a gritty guy, first team all grit. And uh, maybe this is just the beginning for Billy Horschel and a run at major championships. Yeah, I'm going to reiterate what what you just said, Patrick, because I think it's worth diving into the U.S. Open in 2013, his first major championship as a professional. Billy Horschel finished T4. He did not have another top 10 until this year where he earned two of them, one at the PGA Championship T8 and one at the Open Championship T2. He did not even qualify for this year's Masters for the first time in a handful of years. So uh, even when comparing Billy to Justin Rose, Patrick, I mean, uh, uh, Justin Rose has been in the mix consistently throughout his career. Horschel has not. Yeah, exactly. And even the comeback for Billy Horschel, we talked about Justin Rose kind of digging his game out of the dirt. This is a guy who was completely lost last year. He shot in uh, in the mid 80s. I think he shot 85 at the Memorial when he was defending that tournament as well. He had to play in Corrales where he ended up winning. He had to play alternate events on the PGA Tour. That's something that a former FedEx Cup, a playoff winner typically does not do. And uh, he got his game back between not only working on his swing, but working on his clubs too. I think his clubs were bent like three degrees too upright for him, which is insane that someone on the PGA Tour has clubs that aren't perfect for him. And, And so it's really cool to see someone who is, I know he can rub people the wrong way with how fiery he is and how loud he can be. But he's a he's a grade A competitor at the end of the day. And as golf fans, that's what you want to see. You want to see players living and dying on every shot in major championship golf. And it felt like we got that from Horschel and Rose this weekend. Yeah, so the three guys at the top of the board, Xander Shoffley, the, the young superstar, up and coming major champion. You get the two uh, veteran savvy vets in Justin Rose and Billy Horschel. And then we almost had a couple of different long shot stories throughout the week here, Patrick. One of them, Dan Brown, who faded a bit on, on the weekend, shot 73, 74 on the weekend to finish T10. 
But Tristan Lawrence, the South African, went 65-68 on the weekend and really gave this a run because he turned in four under, despite what I thought was a little, little bit tentative with the putting stroke, Patrick, but it didn't matter for those four birdies on the front side. He did play, though, that second nine at one over and fell a couple of strokes short of getting into a playoff, but he stayed relevant throughout this event. You know where he wasn't tentative, Rick? Thirsty Lawrence was not tentative off the tee. He was oh. pounding driver everywhere across Royal Troon. It truly felt like he was playing YOLO ball. Like, all right, I'm in, I'm in the final group somehow in this major championship after being three over at the halfway point. Let's make the most of it. And he did not back down at all. He entered the second nine on Sunday with a two-stroke lead. With nine holes to play in the final major championship of the year, it was Tristan Lawrence who had a two-stroke lead on the back nine on Sunday. And obviously, it didn't go his way. A combination of Xander Shoffley going absolutely nuclear and, and him playing the final nine holes and one over with that drop shot on 12. But what an experience for the guy. A guy who not many people knew, just inside, barely inside the top 100 in the OWGR, a multiple-time winner on the DP World Tour. I believe he missed getting a PGA Tour card by a couple spots last year for the top 10 uh, who, who came over from Europe to uh, the United States in that regard. And so he, he is a, a quality player, but I don't think anyone, you look at that leaderboard on Sunday, Rick, with Xander, Scotty, Rom, and it was like, wait, is Tristan Lawrence going to win this golf tournament? And for the majority, I would say 10 out of the 18 holes, it really felt that way. I find it so interesting that all three of those guys we just talked about, Rose, Horschel, and, and Lawrence, probably before the round would have signed up for their scores, 67, 68, 68, and it was still short of Xander, which says they went out and played great golf. It was Xander who won this thing. Nobody else lost this event. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I cannot remember a final round that was circumstance, everything involved as impressive as Xander Shoffley's final round. Like you said at the top, he did not miss a shot. He did not find a pot bunker all day. And it was a real improvement from Saturday where the driver did get a little scratchy for Xander, but he had everything rolling. And when that happens, it's uh, he's a tough man to beat. He certainly is. And there are still plenty more notables that were in the mix. It was a log jam around Royal Troon on Sunday. I want to talk about that, get some weather takes from Patrick. I'm sure those will be fire, but we're going to continue this conversation after a quick break. Welcome back to the First Cup Podcast live on CBS Sports Network. And Patrick, there are so many great names and notables that were in the mix throughout the entirety of the Open Championship. And I want to give a hat tip to you and your love for Russell Henley because he had another great week, a solo fifth at the Open Championship. And this was a bogey-free 69. And it could have been so much better, Patrick. He did not take advantage of any of the par fives. He played them at even par, had a lot of opportunities, just could not get the flat stick to cooperate. Absolutely brutal, Rick. It really reminds me of that uh, 2016 round from Phil Mickelson, right? Both bogey free, both just don't get the job done, unfortunately. I think the parallels between the two are, uh, you know, as bright for all to see. And uh, Russell Henley has been awesome this year. I've obviously been tooting his horn, driving the rust bus to all campuses, just trying to get support for our cause. And uh, slowly but surely, we're picking up constituents, which is good, especially in an election year. But you look at his first 32 majors as a professional, zero top 10 finishes. His last eight he now has three top 10 finishes. Obviously, the U.S. Open at Pinehurst number two. So honestly, back-to-back -to -back top 10s. A little, little Xander Shoffley in his game. Uh, the Open Championship, and then he finished inside the top 10 at last year's Masters. So I think what's really important for Russell Henley just moving forward is if you get him on a golf course that is firm and fast, 
he will be able to contend. He is not the longest hitter in the world, but he is one of the most accurate. This week, he ranked second in terms of driving accuracy, uh, T1 in terms of greens and regulation, tying Xander Shoffley in that regard. And the putter has made a, a very big improvement in 2024. It's kind of returned to rookie like Russell Henley when he was a great putter. And then in the middle portion of his career, he looked completely lost on the green. So he's a guy who seemingly has every shot in the bag, just not the length. And on a course where you can run it out there, Henley's a threat. I have a stat for you, Patrick, that I think you might enjoy here. So now that we've played all four majors this year, I went through and I grabbed the total strokes gained and Xander Shoffley to no surprise had the best major year of anybody. He gained about 58 strokes to the field. Scotty Scheffler, right around 43. Bryson, right at 41. Now, the three guys who won all the majors this year were first, second, and third in strokes gained for the for the major championship season. That does not happen frequently. Colin Morikawa was fourth, and Russell Henley was fifth. Russell Henley had the fifth best major championship season. He had the second best major championship season of a golfer who did not win one. Uh, I, color me impressed, Patrick. The bounces just didn't go his way, Rick. I have no idea if he was in the right wave this week, but I'm assuming he wasn't. Just, just based just based on my uh, my own narrative that I need to throw out there to the ether. But, I mean, it, it's a great major season. You look at the guys ahead of him on that list. Well, Bryson didn't make the cut this week, so the argument easily could be made. He was a top four player in majors, even though he didn't bag one. But just keep, out, keep an eye out for Russ Bus moving forward. That's all I want to say to the masses. Yeah, it's a very, very strong resume that he's building, but not getting the notoriety that he probably deserves. Shane Lowry is the guy that I was, or at least my wallet, was rooting for on on Sunday. And he was awesome on Thursday, Patrick. He was awesome on Friday. He was awesome on Sunday. 66, 69, 68. The problem is that he shot a 77 on Saturday. And he finished five shots off the lead, Uh, he went out and got hot early on Sunday and it was, there was a chance that he could have applied a little bit of pressure to the top of the leaderboard, but he will have nightmares over that Saturday, 77. He will with 29 holes to play in this championship. He was at eight under par. That is just one stroke off what Xander Shoffley did. Obviously the conditions worsened there Saturday afternoon and the double bogey, on eight seemed to really send him in a downward spiral uh, miss left into the coffin bunker right after Dan Brown miss left in the exact same spot. So he really didn't learn anything, made a double bogey there. And then he played his last 11 holes in that third round at seven over par. And to me, what I learned about Shane Lowry this week, I don't know if it's fair or not. Only time will tell is it seems like some little things can kind of get under his skin from time to time. I've always known him to be a fiery competitor. He's great to watch as well. I throw him in the same bucket as Rosie and and Horschel also, but I I think those little things added up and ultimately were on his undoing, especially on Saturday. And and he mentioned there after the uh, final round on Sunday, how devastated he was walking off the green and how he felt like he kicked away the open championship. So he, he did have a great final round, put his best foot forward. Even after a, uh, an early bogey, he got back on back on the wagon, carting a few birdies there and, and giving himself another great finish in an open. But uh, Shane Lowry's probably thinking to himself today, like, man, if I just played that stretch there on Saturday, those last 11 holes in a couple over got myself into the clubhouse I would have I would have had a great chance to win this coming down the stretch. I'm glad we have this scorecard up here because this Saturday scorecard and remember Saturday's conditions were brutal and the second nine w- w- was so difficult. He was chugging along at one under before he got to the eighth tee and and uh, don't quote me on this but I'm pretty sure those two balls into the coffin bunker on Saturday by him and Dan Brown were the only two balls in there all week. To that point, it, it is actually the cardinal sin to miss into that bunker. It is called the coffin bunker for a reason. And that is where this thing spiraled. Control. Yeah, I, I will say I know of a third golf ball. There's a third golf ball in that bunker just because I had 
some investment on this guy, and it was a Joaquin Neiman who made an eight oh. on that hole. Yes. <laughs> he made an eight and a nine this week, Joaquin Neiman. So shout out to the young Chilean. But you, you just cannot miss in that spot, in that moment. You're fine making bogey on that hole. That's not going to kill you in a golf tournament. But you see your playing partner hit it right there, right before you, and you do the exact same thing. Like you said, it's a cardinal sin. You can't be doing that. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it when he did it. I also couldn't believe the run that we got from John Rahm. Uh, by far his his best major of the year. It ended up being a T7. He closed with a 68 on Sunday, Patrick, in which he birdied the first three holes and then birdied seven. He was the early runner who was trying to put a little bit of pressure, create a little bit of leverage on the top of the board Rom to me, as we enter 2025 and the major championship season, that's 250 some odd days away. He's the most intriguing name. Uh, there's no doubt about his pedigree and the ceiling, but this has not been a good campaign for John Rom. No, a, a pretty forgettable year in general for John Rom. He, he's playing great on live golf. I don't think he has a finish outside the top 10. I think he ranked second in the season long standings there. But major championships, Rick, it's been really disappointing. He did not factor in his defense at the Masters. The PGA Championship, a golf course where I, I thought he'd find success. He was a miscut, a weekend omission. And then obviously the WD at Pinehurst number two as well because of the uh, lesion 13 in between his toes. So this was a welcome sight. John Rahm is a great competitor. <laughs> Sorry to throw that Legion 13 that joke. A, just... That was such a deep cut. Like, if you understood that joke from Patrick, congratulations, you're a golf sicko. Yeah, just throwing it throwing it in there willy-nilly, hoping, uh, hoping a couple people will pick up on it. But, yeah, I this is a guy who you saw that name just go up the leaderboard. He got within two at one point, uh, two under after that birdie on seven. And that's without birdieing either of the par fives, too. And realistically, after seeing Saturday's conditions, I know they weren't forecasted, but the weather can flip on a switch over there. You thought, man, what if John Rahm shoots, like gets in the clubhouse at four under or five under? Is that going to be enough? Is that going to apply some pressure on some of these guys who do have question marks around their game on the first page of this leaderboard? So it's great to see. He's been awesome in open championships. Uh, he was runner up last year to Brian Harmon, I think like one of five guys. So, yeah, I'm with you. I, I think what he does in 2025 is really interesting. He's always been great at Augusta. I think Oakmont's a great fit for him. Quail Hollow and then Portrush are uh, not really question marks. I think more Portrush than Quail Hollow. We know what to expect. So, great player, great result, and uh, one that uh, kind of shows us a little signs of life. I've already got my juices flowing for those four venues next year. I want to talk about the venue from this week, though, Royal Troon, and how it played and where it fits in the Open Championship Rota and, and, and Major Championship context. So we're going to cover that. But first, we're going to take a quick break. Welcome back to the First Cup Podcast live on CBS Sports Network. And Patrick, with an open championship in the books, there were plenty of big names. But to me, a lot of major championship venues and especially open venues, that's the real story. So Royal Troon, looking back, I don't think I heard one negative about Royal Troon all week long. Maybe I was just covering my ears and uh, not listening for it, but I thought it got pretty, pretty good reviews. It did for the most part. You did uh, leave out the Shane Lowry Saturday press conference after uh, stumbling off the 18th green. He was not happy with the setup on Saturday, having to hit driver into the par 3 17th, having to go driver, driver into the par 4 15th and still coming up short. Uh, Terrell Hatton, shocker, breaking news alert. Also okay. wasn't too keen on uh, the par 5 Seven or 16th, I believe, which honestly, I kind of agree with him there. I kind of agreed with if him. The, if the only two uh, arguments <laughs> are coming from Terrell Hatton and Shane Lowry after shooting a Saturday 77 <laughs> and giving up his chances to hold the Claret jug, then there were no complaints about this place. 
That's fair. And for context, Terrell Hatton is the same man who does not like Riviera and does not like Augusta National. So right. take that with a grain of salt. Um, and to, I guess, Royal Troon's credit, we were seeing players hit driver on 16 over the weekend, get it over that burn, right? Instead of laying up short and going for it in two. So, yeah, I think it's a great open course probably grew in my turn in terms of favoritism in in the rota just because it, it asks guys so many different questions i mean how many golf courses do you have par threes that are under 100 yards and then you have some over 200 yards as well and so i think that's the main thing you want for major championship venues right just not one dimensional golf you don't want to see guys pound driver pound a, a mid iron and then have to chip from thick rough around the green like we have seen before and so it seemed like there are options for these players at at this course and those options lead to more intriguing finishes down the line i also like it when you have signature holes that kind of live up to the hype and and for for troon i say that's i say it's eight it's the short par three that's only 100 yards and it's the postage stamp green and then 11 which is the one with the the railroad track that runs alongside of it and becomes one of the more difficult holes on in the road to schedule. And both of those holes lived up to the hype. We talked about it. There were plenty of birdies on eight and there were some massive, massive numbers. There were uh, rounds that were turned there and 11, the same thing. You know, if you miss right on 11, uh, you're just in a horrible spot. So those two holes ended up playing pivotal positions on this leaderboard. And, and I love that. I love when the signature holes live up to what your expectations are. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And early on in the championship, you saw everyone kind of stuffing it there on eight in practice rounds. And you're like, okay, is this a little overhyped? It is only a wedge for these guys. How difficult can it be? And then early on, you have like Todd Hamilton making birdie in the first group out. And you're like, oh, come on. The posted stamp isn't going to live up to the hype. But like you said, you, you saw guys throw away their championship. Joaquin Neiman was great this week outside of two holes. And you know what it was? It was an eight on number eight, the posted stamp, and it was a nine on number 11, the most difficult hole. And then Perfect. you look at the other end of the spectrum, Rick, Xander Shoffley played number eight in nine strokes for the week. He missed a 12 footer to play in an eight strokes uh, on Sunday. And then he is the only man to make birdie on 11 in the final round. So like you said, they lived up to the hype. They played pivotal roles in the championship. And ultimately the man who probably played them the best out of anyone was the guy with the Claret jug. Yeah. Funny how that works. And you can see the splits because mother nature always has a seat at the table when it comes to the open championship. And she did again at Royal Troon. There are times and you can see it in, in round number two, where that morning and afternoon wave, it, there is a massive split two strokes. In some situations, we saw another wave advantage on uh, Saturday as well. This is always a touchy subject. Patrick, because it is luck of the draw. It is rub of the green. You are at the mercy of what weather and what wave you get. You cannot control this. Uh, some say, hey, that's the beauty of an open championship. And others say it's unfair that half the field gets essentially wiped out. No, I am not listening to the unfair crowd. Rick, those are the same people who are excited for the TGL and hitting into simulator screens and all that jazz. These are the same people who uh, want to take their golf balls out of divots in the middle of the fairway, stuff like that. It's sport, right? Sometimes it's not unfair. Sometimes in the NFL, guess what? The ref misses a call. And you know what you have to do? You have to dig down in the dirt and you have to overcome it. And so, yes, were the waves drastically different? Pretty much. The, the, they were they were tough. We saw someone like Sam Burns get the easiest of it. Easiest of it. And you're like, oh my yeah. gosh, Sam Burns is in the penultimate game on Sunday in the Open Championship. And then he ejected out of there. See you later, Cuzzo. And, but, and then also, on the other end, we had someone like Justin Rose, first team all grit, battle through it and still have a chance to win the open down the stretch with seven, eight holes to play. So it's golf. Not everything's going to be perfect. 
Not everything is going to go your way all the time. You got to battle through it. It's a little adversity. Get through it and move on to your next shot. Next year is Royal Port Rush. And I know you remember Royal Port Rush, Patrick, because that's where in 2019 Shane Lowry won only the second time the Open was ever hosted there. The other time, I know you remember this one as well, 1951. That's when Herbert Gustavo. Gustavus Max Faulkner won the Claret Jug. This is a venue that, yeah, there he is, Max Faulkner, 1951. Uh, this is a venue that uh, we've obviously seen more recently as opposed to more historically. Shout out to the boys and girls in the booth. What a pool. Max, looking yeah. strong in that picture in there. Black and white, you got to love it. I do remember 2019 for a number of reasons. Obviously, Shane Lowry kind of ran away from the field there. A very popular win. That is not why I remember it, because that's not how my brain works, unfortunately. I remember it for Rory McIlroy hitting his first tee shot. Highly anticipated. He goes back to Northern Ireland. Guess what Rory does? Does he live up to the hype? Pressure's at it, at, at its pinnacle? Nope. Way left. OB. See you later. <laughs> Fights back, to his credit, on Friday <laughs> to almost make the cut. Misses the cut. And then on Sunday... What I remember the most was J.B. Holmes slow playing Brooks Kepka, who's one of the fastest players in professional golf. J.B. Holmes, not so much. And uh, that kind of affecting both of them. So, yeah, it's a venue without much history. We obviously laid it out there with Max uh, 1951. Who could forget? But uh, it, it seemed to produce good crowds and a, a great leaderboard, honestly. F uh, Fee now and Fleetwood were also in the mix. There's nothing like waking up at three o'clock in the morning to watch Rory McIlroy hit one OB <laughs> on his very first shot of the week. We are going to put a bow on this men's major championship season, but we're going to do it after a quick break. Welcome back to the First Cup Podcast live on CBS Sports Network. Patrick, we have wrapped another major championship year. We will not get another chance to talk about majors until April for the Masters. So looking back, what was your biggest takeaway for these four big events that we rally around each year? I'll go an unconventional route and not touch on the players, but rather the conditions and Honestly, Rick, Mother Nature was pretty kind to us in 2024, which has not typically been the case for major championships. We got a firm and fiery Augusta National that produced an awesome leaderboard with Morikawa, Ludwig, Homa, and obviously Scott or, uh, Scotty Scheffler. We got a sick U.S. Open, just an awesome U.S. Open, firm, fast, everything you wanted out of that. And then at the Open, it seemed like we got every type of Open condition you want it. You wanted the firm and fast and run out. You got it. You want the rain. You got it. You want the wind. Guess what? You have that too. So it, it didn't help in Louisville at Valhalla. That was some golf course, some mother nature. I think it, it rained a bunch there leading into the week and during the week as well. And so I, I think I, I'll take away the connection of the conditions and a few great major venues produced some great championships. I will take the players route here. You know, it is clear that when we get every one of the best players in the world together at the biggest events, it matters. I thought that the blueprint that the PGA tour was laying out for signature events was strong because we got those, those bigger fields, but with how many of the, the top guys now reside on live the majors, just they, they stand alone. That, that is, that is very clear to me, Patrick. That's fair. And even some of the live guys who were not really household names had great major championship seasons. You look at mean Dean Burmeester looking like an XFL coach there at the open championship played great at the PGA championship as well was in the mix at the open. So I think uh, what the majors have done inviting some of these guys like Augusta national did with Joaquin Neiman and then the PGA of America did as well for Valhalla is uh, great for the game as well. 
That right there is Patrick McDonald, and he is a staple on the First Cut podcast, and we pod a lot. Almost every single day of the week, you get recaps from every round of the PGA Tour. You get DFS previews and mega preview pods with all the storylines you need. You can find us on YouTube, and you can find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, along with anywhere else you get your pods.